I call members to order and the first item on our agenda this afternoon is questions to the First Minister. The first question is withdrawn. Therefore, question two, Janet Finn Saunders. How does the Welsh Government ensure patient safety in Wales? Well, we uh, hold all NHS organisations to account on a wide range of patient safety indicators and we encourage uh, an open reporting culture of serious incidents to enable full investigation of every case. Thank you, First Minister. In North Wales, however, we were shocked last week to learn that of the 77 unintended or unexpected incidents resulting in patient deaths registered across Wales in the past 12 months, more than half of these fell within the Betsy Cadwallada University Health Board. Every single one of these cases will have been simply devastating to the family and loved ones of these patients. First Minister, questions will be asked as, as to how the special measures and indeed your government's intervention in realising any improvement, in fact, is actually now to the contrary. I am asking you now, will you please commit to an inquiry as to why the safety of patients under this board and your government's responsibility appears to be increasingly <coughs> compromised? Well, the member doesn't fully understand the way these statistics are compiled. First of all, Rubbish. we encourage honesty and openness, and that means we encourage people to report serious incidents. Now, that means, just like, like the crime statistics, for example, that where more people report serious incidences, then, of course, more are recorded. It doesn't mean there are actually more uh, serious incidents. That said, of course, uh, we want to make sure those incidents are reported. Nothing should be said or done that will discourage reporting in the future because we want to make sure that incidences are reported and are out in the open. I can say to the member that in 2016 to 17, the crude hospital mortality rate for BCU hospitals was 1.79%, which is less than the Welsh average of 1.81%. So yes, it is important that every case is investigated, but it is important that people come forward, that there is an open culture dealing with their complaints, and that, I believe, is what we're seeing here. More complaints uh, are, are coming forward rather than more cases coming forward. Question three. Question three, Vicky Howells. What work is the Welsh Government undertaking to tackle fuel poverty in the Cannon Valley? Well, our key programme for tackling fuel poverty is uh, Welsh Government Warm Homes. Since 2011, we've invested over £240 million to improve the energy efficiency of over 45,000 homes. And since 2012, Nest has spent over £9 million in RCT installing energy efficiency measures to low-income households. First Minister, despite the progress being made in reducing fuel poverty in Cannon Valley and across Wales through the Welsh Government's suite of practical actions, it seems unlikely that fuel poverty will be eliminated by the previous stated target of 2018. Does the Welsh Government plan to review the fuel poverty strategy in light of that? And if so, what lessons will be drawn from the successful and not so successful elements of the current plan? Well, uh, the Welsh Housing Condition Survey is now underway. That will provide important data to help to inform delivery of uh, prosperity for all. It will provide us with a range of information, including updated national fuel poverty estimates and data to help with the targeting of delivery measures. It will also help us to uh, inform uh, discussions with uh, stakeholders, and that will mean, of course, that we can draw on the data that the survey provides uh, in order to uh, uh, help to strengthen the strategy in the future. David Melding. Uh, First Minister, I agree with what you said about energy efficiency, but uh, mm. it's also quite a startling fact. According to Citizens Advice Cymru, only 12% of those on lowest incomes are on the lowest available tariffs. And I do think there's a job to be done here to inform people of uh, uh, the, the tariffs that are available and the lowest ones. Welsh Government, local authorities, housing associations, uh, perhaps when they're doing the, in the various schemes that you've been referring to, can remind people how important it is to seek out the lowest tariff. I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, people tend to stick with the same provider on the same tariff through uh, convenience, and then, of course, they fail to get the, the best deal. Uh, what will help, of course, uh, is to see, uh, as the UK Government has adopted a Labour Party policy, caps uh, on, uh, uh, on variable energy tariffs. Uh, that will help many uh, people who, are not in a, who have not taken the opportunity to change their tariffs or find they're not able to, uh, to do so uh, to benefit from lower prices. Questions now from the party leaders. First of all, Plaid Cymru leader, Leanne Wood. First Minister, later today your government is making a statement on minimum alcohol pricing. Now, I'm aware of the public health arguments 
and the needs to reduce death from cancer in particular. But public health policy should be looking at all problematic substance use. What assessment has your government made of the impact of minimum uh, pricing, alcohol pricing on the use of other substances like illegal drugs? Well, we know that there will be uh, some people, of course, who have, a, have an addiction. Uh, it may be that there are some who, are, who then look at illegal drugs, drugs, but for the vast majority of people, uh, this will have two outcomes. Firstly, uh, it will help to reduce the uh, health issues that surround uh, over-drinking. And secondly, actually, it will help pubs because it's the pubs who suffer the most as a result of uh, supermarket selling that undercuts uh, pubs, which we know are important for our, our community. So there's actually a commercial aspect to, uh, to this as well. But we make no apologies for wanting to ensure uh, that we get rid of scenarios where very cheap alcohol is available to people uh, in a way that uh, causes them to drink too much and therefore affects their health. I have some sympathy with the arguments that you've just outlined, but from your answer it doesn't appear as though any assessment has been made between that link, which I hope very much is an oversight, First Minister. We need to reduce drug-related deaths as well as alcohol-related deaths. Now, drug-related deaths have reached a, a record high in Wales and England. According to latest <coughs> figures, drug-related deaths are up 44% compared to 2012. Yeah. For Wales only figures, in the latest year on record, there was also an increase on the previous year. 168 people lost their lives in 2015. Hospital admissions are also up, which means an increased cost to public services and to the NHS. And anecdotally, we all know that some people are openly using drugs in public places, on our streets, in town centres, where it's less safe both for them and for others. First Minister, can you explain how your substance misuse strategy is using devolved powers to reduce drug-related hospital admissions and drug-related deaths? One of the problems that is faced at the moment is the Misuse of Drugs Act has always found it difficult to keep up with new drugs as they appear onto the market. Drugs like spice, fairly, fairly new, uh, causes people to become extremely violent. Uh, and the leader of Plaid is absolutely right. Uh, there is too much uh, open uh, use of drugs uh, and dealers who seem uh, not to be too uh, concerned about being, being caught. The first thing to do is to target the dealers. They need to be convicted and jailed. Uh, that's where uh, they belong, off the streets. Yes, it's true to say that others may come forward, but it's important to send that message. No, that's not enough of itself. I understand that. How do we deal with people uh, who misuse drugs? Well, the substance misuse strategy is there to help to, uh, to do that. Uh, it is a combination, to my mind, of, the, of medical intervention, but also uh, being strong in terms of clamping down on people who supply the drugs. Well, locking up the dealers hasn't worked so far, and those powers are out with your control. What you do have control over is health. Now, a harm reduction approach has proven to be the most effective at, at reducing drug-related deaths. And in your substance misuse strategy, you claim to be committed to a harm reduction approach. We won't know uh, whether the actions that you've taken are sufficient until the new Welsh statistics come out uh, this winter. But, of course, the Wales and England statistics that we've already seen don't bode well. If you were serious about reducing drug-related deaths, as well as reducing the wider social problems, you would be open to the solutions proposed by Plaid Cymru Police and Crime Commissioner Ar Arvon Jones. Will you agree to meet Arvon Jones and provide the police and others the support that they need to enable a suitably located pilot safe injecting facility which would reduce harm to the public as well as help to reduce unnecessary deaths from harmful drugs. Well, there are already uh, regular meetings that take place between the uh, Peace and Crime Commissioners and Ministers in any event. Mm -hmm. uh, it is absolutely right to say that there is very little point, nor would it be right, to see substance misuse as something that is a crime. Uh, there are people who have medical issues. The suppliers That's are different. Crazy. But those people, of course, who um, are in the position where, where they misuse substances, the intervention for them has to be medical. Uh, and that means working with the police, that's true. It's what the substance misuse strategy is designed to do. She herself said we're waiting for the, uh, for the Welsh uh, figures, uh, and we want to make sure those Welsh, Welsh figures show that uh, we are seeing uh, a positive effect on substance misuse. But the challenge is always there. How do you deal with new drugs that appear all the time, synthesised uh, originally? 
uh, from, uh, from drugs that didn't exist in 1971. She's right to mention heroin, no, right, right to mention heroin, but it's hugely important that we, as we do, that we work with the Police and Crime Commissioners, as we do, that we develop and give our substance misuse strategy the time to, uh, to develop. And in that way, I believe uh, we will help fewer and uh, we'll help more and more people to get off the substances they become addicted to. Leader of the Opposition, Andrew R. T. Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, there are pressures across the United Kingdom when it comes to the health service. In June 2015, your government took into special measures at the North Wales Health Board, Betsy Cadwallader, um, and in March this year, you said that actually where deficits run out of control and problems exist in other health boards across Wales, you might well have to consider intervening in those health boards. What we've learned in recent months is that the deficit has doubled in the North Wales Health Board. Waiting times have gone up uh, by, by 79%, from 4,858 to 8,700, uh, and the deficit is projected at the end of this year to be a hundred million pounds, uh, cumulatively over the three years. Cumulatively over the three years, 50 million for this one financial year. The previous two was 25 million pounds. How can people have confidence that your government is putting Betsy on the road to recovery? And importantly, the concerns that are raised by the member from Aberconway are being addressed when the statistics show that on waiting times, on recruitment and deficit control and reduction, you are missing all your own targets. Well, this would be wrong. First of all, he had to clarify his suggestion that there would be a £100 million deficit. Uh, we do not expect any of the health boards to come in with a deficit by the end of this financial year. And that is a message that uh, we make very plain to them. Well, First Minister, with the greatest respect in the, their own board papers, which I presume obviously you have sight of and obviously help put together, because it's under your control, this health board, they are projecting a deficit in this financial year of £50 million. Pounds. It's not my calculations, it's their calculations. And they talk of, unless there are mitigating measures and actions implemented to bring that deficit down, that deficit will exist. Here in Cardiff, you were saying that isn't the case. Your own managers and directors in North Wales, who are responsible for the day-to-day -day delivery of service, are saying that there is this deficit. You can't have the two working there. Uh, perhaps that's a cause for concern, that you're so disconnected from what is actually happening on the ground. I ask you again, First Minister, with waiting times going through the roof, with the deficit and not in control, and above all, the inability to recruit and retain staff, either at GP level or within the hospitals, how, after nearly three years under your direct supervision and control, Control, can the residents of North Wales have confidence that their health board is on the road to recovery? They can have every confidence. As I've said, we do not expect the health board to be in deficit by the end of the financial year. If they identify an issue now, they must deal with it. That is their responsibility. Uh, he talks about waiting this going through the roof and offers no evidence for that. He also says there are problems with recruitment and retention. I can say to him that train labour work has been hugely successful in filling training places, particularly uh, in terms of nursing applications as well. And do you know? Do you know what GPs say to us? And I've had this from one consultant who said this to me a month ago. He said, the reason why I wanted to come to Wales was I liked the recruitment campaign and two other words, Jeremy Hunt. So, so why, is the well, why are waiting times that much better in the UK as opposed to what's happening here in Wales? I used figures directly. Well, you say they're not, First Minister. A&E, the 12-hour wait in England, is 78 people waited out of a population of 55 million people, 12 hours or more in A&E. In Wales, the figure was 2,400. 438 out of a population of 3 million. They're not my figures, they're your figures. And what I'm just trying to seek Take from you, First Minister, is some ability to have confidence. I used the waiting times that your government published last week that said that waiting times had doubled from 4,858 to 8,708. I use the deficit figures that the Health Board themselves have published in their board report. I've used the example that the Health Board say themselves that this deficit will exist at the end of the financial year unless mitigating actions are taken. So everything I have quoted to you has come either from the Health Board or statistics that have come from your own government. I merely seek assurances from you, First Minister, after nearly two and a half years of your government being in direct control of the North Wales Health Board, that the Health Board is progressing to a situation where waiting times will come down, 
doctor vacancies will be filled, and above all, the deficit will come under control. And on two occasions, you have failed to give any assurances to date. I think that tells you more about your grip and re on reality yeah, than yeah. it does about anything else. Well, all I can say to him is there's been a complete abdication of responsibility towards the NHS in England. Every time a health board uh, underperforms, it's yeah. never the fault of Jeremy Hunt, is it? Never the fault of the Conservative yeah. government or Jeremy Hunt. Let me give him a figure. That is, that is correct, so he can mull over it. In England, the total waiting list is now the highest on record. The highest on record. That's Tory stewardship of the NHS. There were 409,342 patients over the English target, more than doubled over the last three years. More than doubled over the last three years. We know in Wales we have gone in the other direction. And he sits there. He sits there and acquiesces in a bung to Northern Ireland, £1.67 billion, some of it on health. He did nothing to represent his country. He did nothing to represent his country. What representations did he make to, his, to the UK government and his colleagues to demand that Wales should get a Barnet equivalent of that money? Nothing. He's too scared of them. Yeah. Leader of the UK group, Neil Hamilton. Uh, returning to the theme mentioned by the leader of Plaid Cymru earlier on today, the Public Health Minimum Price for Alcohol Wales Bill, how can the First Minister possibly support a measure which is so regressive in the way it works? This is a measure which is explicitly designed, disproportionately to target those drinks which are consumed in uh, disproportionate measures by people on low incomes. It's well known that low income households buy fewer units of alcohol overall but more of what they buy is priced at less than 40 pence <coughs> per unit. Where is the equity in a measure that leaves the champagne socialists of the posher suburbs of Car Cardiff unaffected, but target bombs the beer drinkers of Blaenau Gwent? Is he seriously saying that people on low incomes are proportionately bigger drinkers? No. That's a snobbery of, of an, uh, an extent I've never so quite seen uh, before, I have to say that. And the, the consequence of his argument is that in that case, we should reduce the tax on tobacco. Yeah. Reduce the tax on tobacco, because that's disproportionately uh, regressive as well. So let's reduce the tax on tobacco as well. It's exactly the same argument. What we want to do is to make sure that, that alcohol does not get cheaper and cheaper as it has done, so that people drink more and more, because they see it as cheap. As I said earlier on, there's also an issue here for the pubs. Pubs have been hammered year after year after year after year by cheap supermarket alcohol. And pubs are responsible places where people drink. They, they look after drinks. They don't serve people who are drunk. And pubs have been lost at a rate of knots in our communities. And you speak to any publican, and they will say to you that part of the reason is that people are buying cheap supermarket alcohol sold at below cost price quite often. Now, those people deserve fairness as well. So, yes, there is a, of course there's a health aspect to this. But also, of course, as a side issue, we know that one of the consequences is that it will provide a far better level playing field uh, for pubs as well say that uh, people on low incomes buy more alcohol. I said the opposite, actually, that people on low incomes buy less alcohol overall than people on higher incomes. But more of the alcohol that they do drink is cheaper brands, not more expensive brands. So it's going to have a disproportionately tough effect upon people on yeah. low incomes. The Centre for Economic and Business Research said in 2009 that there's substantial evidence overall that heavier drinkers are least responsive to price changes. So the problem alcohol drinkers are the ones who are least likely to respond to the measures which are now being proposed. What's going to happen here is that the, the real problem is we'll carry on drinking, but actually they'll have less money to spend on things like food. So in other dietary respects, their health is going to suffer. This will have no positive in impact whatsoever. The only people who are really going to benefit from this are the supermarkets, because this is not a tax which is being imposed. You will just raise the price of a cheap product, and that will produce extra profits for the supermarkets. It certainly won't produce extra profits for pubs. Well, again, the same argument could be used for cigarettes. If he's saying that the tax on cigarettes should be reduced because it's regressive, let's, let's hear him say that. As far as alcohol is concerned, we know that alcohol has got proportionally cheaper. We know it's, it's encouraged people to drink more. No question about that. If it's cheaper, it will do that. This is a way of ensuring the balance is right between the price of alcohol and people's health. I see nothing wrong with that, and I, 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 it's uh, hugely important that we have a responsible attitude to, to alcohol rather than one that says, you know, buy three, buy one, get one free, buy two, get one free. You know, these are, and they're not, they're not always on the cheapest brands. They're quite often on brands that are, quite, are proportionally quite expensive. That's the way that people are encouraged to buy more and drink more, and surely that's not something we want to encourage. 
there is a problem with a relatively small number of people who overindulge. Uh, and, of course, we do want to target those. The problem with a measure of this kind is it's so scattergun in its approach that it actually penalises the many who are moderate drinkers whilst not actually having any measurable effect upon those whom we do want to help. I don't follow that logic. The same logic applies to cigarettes. He, he could stand up and he could say, well, it penalises the occasional uh, smoker and so the duty on tobacco should be, should be reduced. Uh, this, the two things have the same kind of effect. Look, for me, it's hugely important that as a society, we don't have alcohol being sold below cost price, and it happens in some of the offers we see in the supermarkets. Uh, we don't have uh, people being encouraged to buy more alcohol than they otherwise would want to buy. That encourages people who would otherwise be quite moderate drinkers to drink more than, than, is, good, than is good for them. Uh, and that is something that we're keen to, to avoid. As it happens, as a, as, uh, as, as a side effect, it also enables pubs to be able to compete on a level playing field with the supermarkets who, you know, who have driven so many pubs out of business. Don't, don't, you know, don't talk to me, talk to publicans and they will tell you this. The difference in price proportionally between supermarket alcohol now and alcohol in pubs is far, far greater than ever it was uh, before. And we need to make sure uh, that people have a place to go uh, in, their, in, in villages where they live, through pubs, for example. This is not what the intention of the other legislation is. The intention is that it's, it's a legislation that deals with health. Uh, but there are, of course, wider, side, uh, wider effects that are identified. Question Pedwar. Question four, Jenny Rathbone. How is the Welsh Government using public procurement to drive up horticultural production in Wales? Well, the National Procurement Service develops collaborative approaches which aim to grow the amount of Welsh produce supplied to the public sector. Thank you. Um, I've just come from the Vegetable Summit uh, being held in the Pier Head at the same time as in London and Edinburgh. And uh, we heard really important pledges um, from a wide variety of producers and promoters of, um, for example, children's rights. The Children's Commissioner highlighted the fact that <laughs> nearly 80% of children aged 5 to 10 are not eating enough vegetables and 95% of 11 to 16 year olds are not eating uh, enough vegetables to be able to learn and play effectively and that this is a children's rights issue. We heard important prejudice from um, the largest supermarket in the UK, Tesco, who have agreed to buy seasonal veg from UK growers, as well as putting more vegetables in their meal deals. Castle Howell, Brains, Cardiff University, Cardiff Met, Cardiff and the Vale <coughs> Health Board, um, Cardiff Council, all pledging to serve and promote more vegetables in their pubs, canteens and dining rooms. What can we do to ensure that that increased purchase of vegetables comes from Welsh producers rather than from other UK outlets or indeed from abroad? Well, can I welcome the fact that the uh, Vegetable Summit is taking place at the Pier Head building as, as we speak. It brings together farmers, retailers, processors and government looking at the supply chain and how we can raise vegetable production. We are committed through the Food and Drink Action Plan, which we share with our publicly appointed industry board, to not only grow the Welsh food and drink sector, but to do so sustainably and to tackle the deep-rooted challenges of diet. And the National Procurement Service has set up buying arrangements that allow Welsh public bodies to access a wide range of vegetable products to support healthier meal planning. Paul Davis. Uh, and Dylan, question. Following on from Jenny Rathbone's question, can you tell us what discussions the Welsh Government has had with local authorities on food procurement in the public sector to ensure that more local producers are used by local authorities? And also, can you tell us one thing that your government has done over the past 12 months to make a difference and to ensure that more and more local producers are being used in the public sector? Well, a cooperative group has been established and that includes some um, from the public sector in Wales and the aim of that group is to ensure that we get a good deal on procurement and that is in collaboration with local bodies and the producers in order to progress this project. And so things are being done in working with the industry to ensure that more Welsh produced food is used. At one time, one of the problems with the gr big contracts, such as those with the health service, was that there wasn't a business or an organisation large enough to ensure that they could get into that market or that there was sustainability of um, 
supply. But things have improved now. We've worked at looking and su- to support these companies in different ways. Thank you, Chloe. I see, First Minister, that Denby plums are to be served as a dessert tomorrow. So everyone is welcome to contribute by eating those wonderful plums. But as we leave the CAP, which has never given any support to horticulture in Wales, what steps will you take as a government to ensure that there is support to develop the infrastructure to ensure that farmers can now invest in horticulture for these new markets? Well, this is something that is under consideration with the industry at the moment. And the first thing I'd like to emphasise is that the same amount of money should be available in future as it, as is currently available and that that funding should be allocated or ring-fenced fa- in a way and that nothing should affect that without an agreement between all the governments. Having said that, there is now an opportunity to consider in which way we can use that funding for the benefit of Welsh farmers and look at alternate ways of working because I remember 17 years ago when I was a member of the Assembly's Agriculture Committee, a review was undertaken at that time on diversification and what came right at the top of the list as regards the greatest strength in the sector was the uh, cultivation of organic vegetables. And, of course, the subsidy payment scheme wasn't flexible enough in order to ensure that we could use that funding in the way in which we would wish to use it. But perhaps there may be an opportunity to do so now. Question five, having David. Will the First Minister make a statement on patterns of self-employment in Wales? Well, self-employment remains a cornerstone of the Welsh economy and is central to the national strategy. We continue to support businesses to start and grow, to invest and, of course, to improve uh, their contribution to the economy of Wales. Uh, This afternoon I chaired the cross-party group on small and medium-sized enterprises and it was our pleasure to welcome the Federation of Small Business to launch their report, Going Solo, Understanding Self-Employment in Wales, uh, written by Professor Andrew Henley and Dr Mark Lang. There are a number of uh, recommendations for government there, uh, but one of the stark issues in the report is that the largest levels of self-employment are in power, so 23%, and the lowest levels are in the northern valleys that I represent and others uh, at 8.7%. What specifically can the Welsh Government do to incentivise and increase self-employment in those valleys communities, and particularly among underrepresented groups um, and women? What's interesting about the report is that there's been an assumption that the reason why more people are self-employed is because economic circumstances have dictated that they've lost their jobs. But in fact, it seems to indicate that it's entrepreneurial pull. It's actually a desire to be more entrepreneurial. Uh, which is something we have you know, sort of encouraged for many, many years in Wales. I mean, as somebody who was self-employed, mainly, before I came uh, to this place, I understand some of the um, challenges that that, can, uh, that, 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 that 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 can cause. How do we take it forward in, in the in the Valleys, Valleys Task Force? Uh, that's done a lot of work uh, to see how we can encourage more self-employed. I don't believe that people lack entrepreneurial flair in the Valleys. I think it's encouragement. Uh, it's being able to say to people, you can do this. Uh, there's no reason why you can't be successful, and people need that uh, that encouragement. And that's exactly one of the things that the Valleys Task Force is looking to, uh, to move forward in the future. Russell George. Yeah, thank you, um, First Minister, I also attended the event which uh, Heaven uh, chaired uh, earlier on. And we heard how rural Wales is heavily reliant on um, the contribution of self-employment to the economy. And Heaven's pointed out 23% of those in power are self-employed. And that compares to the Welsh average of 13%. Now, the FSB Wales report has found that those who are self-employed tend to be older uh, and young people are are not following in their footsteps. Now, um, can I ask what consideration uh, has the Welsh Government given to understanding the barriers to young people becoming self-employed, in rural Wales in particular, uh, and what potential could a mid-Wales growth deal play to ensure that there are local solutions which meet the demands of self-employment in Wales, opposed to a pan-Wales solution which might not always be appropriate? I think regional solutions are important. Uh, the member is right to say that, that there can't be one size fits all uh, across Wales. Uh, when it comes to, to younger people, uh, much of the starts in schools, to my mind. I know that work has been done in schools with um, encouraging entrepreneurial projects, uh, and of course the Young Entrepreneur Scheme, which uh, which we uh, we have, and also of course providing the kind of financial support to the youngsters that they need. Older people often have access to capital, 
in a way that younger people don't. They can use that capital to set up uh, in, in business. How do we support um, people to come into business? Business Wales uh, is one area where that's done, of course. Uh, the Development Bank will be able to, to assist uh, uh, people to come into business as well. Improving SME's ability to access finance, that's the biggie. We know that the banks in the UK have historically been resistant uh, to providing capital for uh, start-up enterprises, which is why we fell behind. Uh, for many, many years, which is why, of course, the development, one of the reasons why the Development Bank uh, will be there. You can encourage people, but they need to access capital to start up their business. And unless they've got family capital behind them, there's got to be another way of doing it. And that, of course, uh, is where Business Wales, where the Development Bank for Wales comes in. Adam Price. You know, Pethem, we are. One of the most striking things in the report is this fact, namely that 38% of the total jobs growth in Wales over the past 10 years can be attributed to the self-employed and over the same period there's been no net increase in the inward investment sector and again and I quote from the report the language of drawing up economic policies is skewed hugely towards the importance of securing inward investment and foreign ownership now, does the First Minister accept the figures provided by the FSB? And if so, does he accept the need to change emphasis now to Indigenous business and the self-employed? Well, I don't think that we need to choose or make a choice. At one time in the days of the WDA, the emphasis was completely on inward investment, didn't they didn't care really about small businesses. I remember talking to an employee of the WDA, so the focus was on securing inward investment. And after LG, nothing else came in. So it is extremely important that we build a foundation of self-employment in the economy. But I don't think that we can do that by avoiding giving any support to businesses that do employ thousands of people, such as Tata, um, Airbus, EDS and so on, and GE, who employ thousands of people in Wales. So we must have an emphasis on attracting foreign investment, but it shouldn't be solely our strategy. And I would argue that we have now struck the right balance and we want to ensure that more and more businesses aren't only established in Wales, but grow in Wales because one of the problems we've always faced is that businesses grow up to a particular level and then the owners sell them. So we must ensure that people should be able to feel that they can grow those businesses, that they become larger and that to me is the greatest challenge in the, eco in the economy I'd say, don't sell out, stay and we'll assist you to grow. Question 6, Mark Mishwood. How is the Welsh Government yeah. supporting the palliative care sector in Wales? Yes, the updated end-of-life care delivery plan published in March sets out the extensive range of actions we're taking to deliver a collaborative approach to improve end-of-life care throughout Wales, and that includes £6.4 million to provide specialist palliative care services. Uh, well, thanks for your uh, answer. Um, as you're probably aware, the majority of end-of-life care in Wales is provided by Wales' 13 adults and two children's hospices. Uh, you indicate a figure of roughly 6.4 6 million, I think you said, but they have to uh, they spend 32.5 million pounds a year to deliver those services in people's homes and also uh, daycare uh, and respite. Uh, so they're having to raise over 2 million pounds a month. And they're keen to help you, the Welsh Government, and their local health boards do very much more. How can you or will you engage with them and ask them how they can help you achieve more, where perhaps a little bit more funding from the health boards and the government would save massively more for health boards and liberate services uh, to help tackle some of the other problems we've heard referred to today in different contexts? Yeah. Well, if we look at the recent report by Hospice UK into hospice care in Wales, uh, that is something that we, we welcome, what the report uh, said. It recognises the positive steps outlined in the palliative and end-of-life care delivery uh, plan. It, it does highlight the need for assurances about long-term funding uh, and as part of the budget agreement with Plaid Cymru we did make £1 million extra available in 2017 to further enhance uh, end-of-life care uh, provision, that is recurrent funding as well. 
But of course, in terms of engagement uh, with the sector, it is the, it is the care boards that provide that level of uh, engagement. And that's why, of course, we work with them in order to identify the resources that are needed. Thank you very much, Chloe. Then the cross-party group on hospices and palliative care here in the Assembly is looking at the possibility of holding inquiry into how to deal with inequalities in terms of access to hospice care in Wales. You referred to the funding secured in agreement between ourselves and the government, but isn't the truth of the matter that a series of Labour governments has failed to tackle that fundamental element that there is inequality in terms of access to this crucial care across Wales? No, I don't accept that. We have ensured that there is investment available to the health boards and it's a matter for them to ensure that the service is available and it's something that we worked with to ensure that that is implemented. We know that the hospices themselves have taken a greater role over the past five years than previously, not just with the care side but with giving people advice. And now we wish to work with the boards to ensure that we know what next needs to be done in order to ensure that there is a consistent and uniform service available throughout Wales. Question 7, David Rowlands. Yeah, okay, with, uh, what assessment has the First Minister made on the impact that any changes to immigration controls following Brexit will have on the NHS in Wales? Yes, it's bad. <coughs> well... I thank the First Minister for his observation, uh, but the latest figures show that immigrant workers from uh, the EU amount to just 1.55% of employees in NHS Wales, and given that the Welsh population uh, of uh, immigrants from uh, the EU amounts to 33.3%, uh, 3 it would seem that controls on immigration may well have an, a positive effect on our health service. But I have previously brought to the attention of this chamber the fact that each year 80,000 applicants to work in the UK NHS are turned down due to lack of training places. Firstly, uh, surely, First Minister, it is time that we in Wales expanded training facilities, reconsidered the practice of sending every nurse to university and explored the possibility of reintroducing the distinction of SEN and SRN nurses and on the ward training, particularly for SEN staff. Incidentally, Mark Drayford said in 2015 that discussions on the long-term future of the NHS in Wales should sit outside the knockabout of day-to-day -day party politics. Perhaps, uh, First Minister, we should once again examine that excellent suggestion. Could I say to the member, I could not care less where doctors come from when they work in the Welsh NHS, as long as they deliver an excellent service to our patients. There are many uh, doctors who come from the EU and beyond India, of course, we know many doctors have come from, from India. Frankly, they are great additions to our NHS. The market for doctors and for nurses is worldwide. It's worldwide. People will go with supportable qualification. They will go to where they think they will get the best deal for them as an individual and from their families. Now, we know, for example, it's true to say that EU nurses make up a very small uh, percentage of the NHS workforce in Wales, but can we really afford to lose 360 nurses? Is that what he's saying? Because he, what he seems to be saying is that's fine as long as we train people to a lower standard uh, in yeah. the future, and that will be fine as far as the future is concerned. Is he really saying, for example, that we don't want doctors from the EU? Well, I have to say, I want to make sure that doctors and nurses come to work in Wales, regardless of their nationality, because they will add a lot more to the NHS than they take out. The myth that is peddled by his party is that somehow immigration puts a strain on the NHS. Most of the people who come to Wales are young. They pay taxes, they pay far more in than they take out via the NHS. And we know that we pay tribute to those doctors from the EU and beyond who come to work in the Welsh NHS, who contribute to treating our people, who save lives, and for me that's far more important than checking their passports. Susie Davids. Uh, the External Affairs Committee recently uh, reported on the implication of Brexit for Welsh ports, of course, um, and uh, there was criticism there that the Economy Secretary hadn't at that stage had direct conversations with uh, his counterpart in Ireland, but I, I think that may have happened now. 
Um, do you know whether there were any discussions about uh, whether existing technology could be rolled out to help maintain the invisible uh, border between North, uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic, but also to redu uh, reduce the delays in transit of people as well between Wales and the Republic of Ireland itself? Well, well, firstly, the reason why the committee mentioned it is I mentioned it to the committee. I was the one who first raised it, uh, the issue of the uh, post. I, I, I discussed it months ago with Leo Varadkar when he became uh, Taoiseach uh, and made it clear that we could not support a scenario where there was a more seamless border between Northern Ireland and the Republic and Wales and the Republic. Why 70% of trade in GB and Ireland goes through the Welsh ports? If there's any incentive to go through the Scottish ports instead through Northern Ireland, Obviously, it's bad. The committee identified that it's bad for uh, for Wales. So there have been discussions with the Irish government on this. Frankly, I know the members' views on on, on Brexit, and I, you know, I, I appreciate them. I have now seen many documents in the UK government that say that the issue of border control will be uh, taken forward by way of innovative technology. It doesn't exist. The technology does not exist. If it existed, we'd, we'd, see, we'd have sight of it by now. It talks about having uh, innovative solutions, exploring solutions. That is code for we have no idea how to deal with this. Now, it's one thing, of course, to have border-free travel between, or passport-free travel between Wales and Ireland. Customs-free travel is a different thing. Uh, there were always random checks in those ports in years gone by, but not every um, vehicle was checked. There's a greater problem in Dover because the UK doesn't have the capacity uh, at the moment to uh, put in place border controls in Dover with enormous delays. Uh, same, I suspect, applies on the French side as well, if, if I'm honest, uh, in, in, in Calais. I, I do not believe that there is a technological solution to this. If there was one, then by now we'd, we'd know from the UK government what that solution is. One of the solutions that was put to me was that there would be cameras on the border between North and South in Ireland. You put cameras in Northern Ireland and we could open a book as to how long they'd stay there because they would not, be, they would, just wouldn't stay there. It's a physical man manifestation of the border. People would see them as a breach of the peace agreement. So it's an intractable problem. It can be resolved. The resolution is that the UK stays in the customs union. Then there's no problem. There's no problem. UK leaves the customs union and you have to have the same kind of border as exists, for example, between Gibraltar and Spain because Gibraltar is outside the customs union. That is an extremely hard border. But you cannot have a scenario where goods go to two different markets in two different customs union without any kind of physical checks uh, on crossing a land border. This has always been the, the problem to my mind. In the Brexit referendum, nobody thought about Ireland and nobody thought about that border. And it's still an intractable problem. The solution? Stay in the customs union. Stefan Lewis. Uh, of course, one of the greatest threats to staffing long term in the Welsh NHS would be for us to have a one size fits all UK immigration policy after separation with the European Union. Uh, the University of Edinburgh um, have published a paper by Professor Christina Boswell, uh, Scottish Immigration Policy After Brexit, evaluating options for a differentiated approach. It looks at a number of um, ways of um, regional and national approaches to migration uh, post-Brexit, knowing the intentions of, of the UK government in terms of, of their aspirations. One, uh, one, the options include looking at human capital, points-based system, post-study work schemes, employer-led schemes, occupational shortage lists, which I would uh, suggest are of particular importance here in Wales. And in this paper, um, they are proposing um, imaginative ways in order to have minimal administration uh, costs and burdens. Would the First Minister agree that this is now worth exploring and taking forward uh, seriously, that we need Wales to have its say on a uh, regional or national post-Brexit migration policy for the UK because at the moment this is the only constituent part of the UK that has said very little about that prospect. Otherwise, we face having the UK net migration uh, target being the big uh, policy objective of the UK that, as we know, will be detrimental to Welsh public services and the Welsh economy. Well, well let me just remind you of what, what I have said uh, publicly has said is uh, fears at rest. First of all, I don't agree with an artificial cap. Uh, I don't see what sense that has. Uh, surely an economy needs to recruit according to its needs, not have an artificial cap. If there were to be an artificial cap, then there are serious issues that arise as to whether there be sectoral caps. Now, I have no doubt that the thinking of the UK government will be to do as much as possible for the City of London, and the financial services sector is important to us, but it's hugely important for the City of London, and we will end up with a higher sectoral cap proportionately for the City than we do for the NHS. Now, clearly, that would not be in Wales's interests. He didn't say it specifically, but I know he's, he is intimating the idea of regional 
uh, quotas. I think that's an interesting idea. It is done in Canada. It is done in Australia. All right, they're far bigger, uh, but it's not impossible to uh, to do this. Personally, I prefer there not to be a cap. But if there is to be a cap, I think then there is a case for uh, looking carefully at whether regional quotas would work, uh, and particularly whether they'd work for Wales. Question: Oith Shangwenlian. Question: Oith Shangwenlian. Will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's location strategy? The location strategy will deliver an economically and environmentally sustainable estate that is aligned with this Government's future needs. The strategy maintains our commitment to being located across Wales and ensures that we are optimising the efficiency of our estate and reducing our operating costs. Well, it's entirely apparent that the jobs location strategy isn't working if the intention was to spread government jobs to all parts of Wales and retaining the, the, those that already existed. People in my constituency feel that we're being left behind, a feeling which is backed up by facts. Fact one, your government intends to close and sell a building in Carnarvon without any intention to erect a new building in its place, creating great uncertainty. Fact two, the number of government jobs which are located in Carnarvon has reduced by 35% over the past seven years. The intention of the strategy is clear, but once again, you have failed when it comes to a matter of delivering those objectives. So will you reconsider, look at the strategy again in order to set new criteria and specific targets in order to deliver growth and quality jobs in all parts of Wales? Well, may I say to the member that the Carnarvon office won't be quitting the town, it's just moving building. It's true to say that they're actually moving from the building where they are at present on the top and they're looking at more modern office space in order to stay in the town. There's no problem about leaving Carnarvon. Is it true that some jobs are being lost? It's true for the whole of Wales. Over a thousand jobs have been lost in every part of Wales. Having said that, of course, if we look at North Wales, we have the Llandino Junction office and there will be the Development Bank headquarters in Wrexham. And so we are committed to moving jobs out of Cardiff. At the inception of the Assembly, there was an office in Carnarvon, but nothing in Merthyr, nothing in Llandino Junction, not very much in Aberystwyth. The Forestry Commission was there, but nothing else. We have demonstrated our commitment to moving jobs out of Cardiff, and there's no problem whatsoever with regard to the Carnarvon office. I know how important Carnarvon is in supporting and assisting farmers and also securing employment in the town. Finally, question nine, Joyce Watson. Uh, uh, What guarantee has the First Minister obtained from the UK Government during Brexit discussions in relation to securing human rights? Well, the UK Government has said it won't repeal or replace the Human Rights Act while the process of leaving the EU is underway. We also support efforts to amend the withdrawal bill to ensure, whenever it's introduced, to ensure the UK continues to respect the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights after we leave the EU. Uh, Well, when Britain does leave uh, the EU, the Charter of Fundamental Rights will no longer have any effect in UK law. And that means that those rights not covered by the Human Rights Act, for example, the rights of the child, workers' rights and discrimination could be scrapped. Uh, The Great Repeal Bill White Paper does promise, however, to protect existing rights. But I don't know about you, uh, First Minister, but I am hugely sceptical about a Conservative Party that opposed many of those rights in the first place in terms of trusting them to defend rights post-Brexit. And we only have uh, to look uh, very quickly across at the way that they have been willing so far to gamble with EU citizens' residence rights. But on another tangent, uh, First Minister, will you reassure Welsh University over their rights to academic freedom from government meddling? I'm sure that you would have read today, as I have, uh, the reports on the frankly sinister letter sent by the Tory MP Chris Heaton-Harris to all Vice-Chancellors asking for the names of anyone teaching European affairs or Brexit? Well, first of all, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights contains rights and freedoms under six titles. Dignity, freedoms, equality, 
solidarity, citizens' rights and justice. Surely there is nobody who would argue that none of those things should apply uh, when we leave, which is why it makes sense for that Charter to, uh, to remain. There are some, not all in fairness, but there are some within the Conservative Party who would love to get rid of so many of the protections that have been built up over many, many years. They are the hard right uh, of the, uh, the Conservative uh, Party. Uh, I'm sure that they, they would delight uh, in removing as many uh, rights and protections as uh, possible. Uh, I hope the, uh, the sensible people within that party uh, actually uh, win out. Uh, of not sensible, uh, I understand that a letter was sent by an MP I've not heard of, uh, uh, Ms Heaton Harris, uh, who sent a letter to all academics, all academics, not someone I've heard of before, all academics uh, demanding to know who teaches courses on Brexit and the content of those syllabuses. Content of those syllabuses. That is uh, a, a, as authoritarian request uh, as could possibly be made. Now, I don't say that the entire Conservative Party would agree with his actions, but if that is the case, it's incumbent on government ministers to slap him down, metaphorically, uh, because it's absolutely outrageous that somebody should look to create, in effect, uh, a list of people uh, who are there to be criticised because they do not follow the party line. I suspect this gentleman would have a lot to teach Stalin. Thank you, First Minister. The next item.